Thank you very much. Um, yeah, okay. Um, the two books I'm trying, I'm going to try to summarize in the next 10 minutes, focus more on the policy side of things. So it basically, it is, if we think about the work we did at Crease, it's sort of a natural progression, these two books. Uh, we first started off with thinking about, okay, what are the linkages between the presence of horizontal inequalities <coughs> and the risk of violence? And then we started asking us the question, okay, what are post-conflict countries doing? Well, how are they dealing with these inequalities in the aftermath? And more generally, what can we do about constructively reducing these inequalities? And the central question of the first book I want to discuss is horizontal inequalities post-conflict development uh, is actually to what extent have post-conflict <coughs> countries dealt with horizontal inequalities, what type of policies have they implemented, and to what effect. Now, um, in the book we have, uh, it contains seven case studies. Uh, they are listed here. Um, and all of these countries are sort of selected because they have had a conflict in their recent past where there was a clear ethnic dimension or a clear cultural dividing line in the conflict present. Um, there were also four thematic chapters, one on macroeconomic policies, uh, one on uh, poverty reduction strategy papers, one on privatization, and one on employment generation. Now, the idea with these thematic chapters was to look, look at first, analyze, okay, what type of policies are generally being implemented with regard to these themes, to these various uh, sectors, um, but then also specifically look at where, whether or not horizontal inequality considerations come into these uh, general policies and to what extent they could come into that uh, respect. Um, the analysis of the case studies was basically based on, uh, on, the, the, on the following three cascading parameters, recognition, implementation, and effectiveness. And there were basically three sort of three questions linked to that, that we tried to answer in each of the case studies that we studied. The first one was, to what extent did post-conflict countries recognize the role of horizontal inequalities in, in, in the as a cause of conflict? And did they attach to that certain uh, commitments that they had to be tackled? A second element was implementation, basically looking at to what extent the recognition, if it was there, was actually transformed of translated into actual policies. Policies that um, uh, whether, uh, and, uh, we looked at it also whether these policies were adequately, adequately funded, whether they were well implemented, and whether they were adopted in the mainstream policy making. And the third element had to do with the effectiveness. So when countries would recognize that horizontal inequalities played a role in provoking the conflict, and they would implement certain policies, what was the effect of these policies? Did they actually lead to reduction in horizontal inequalities? And possibly, did it also have a positive effect on stabilizing the country? Now, clearly with the last parameter, is, is a very complex issue uh, to, 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 to be analyzed, because there are a range of other factors that play a role. First, groups can are fluid, so the, the relevant groups that may play a, were the most important in the pre-conflict setting might have changed, so different groups might have come up, so that complicates matters in that respect. But it might also be that other policies and, and, and measures have certain indirect effects on, on, on the evolution of the prevailing uh, horizontal inequalities. So we try to take these complicated factors into account in the, in the analysis, and, and particularly in the, in the comparative overview that we that we provided of, of the cases. Now, let me get, say, a few words about the findings <laughs> and, well, at least the major policy recommendation that, that we sort of developed from them. Let me start on a positive note. In the majority of the cases that, that we studied, there was a clear recognition that, indeed, inequalities did play an important role in provoking these conflicts. However, if we then looked at to what extent this was translated into actual policies, it, it turned out that only in a few cases actual policies were implemented and the cases that actually did something were often quite limited in the sense that the, the, the measures and policies were limited to the social sectors or certain development projects were developed in the poorer regions. Very few cases, possibly only the case of Nepal jumps out, 
um, was there a very was there a broad broad ranging effort <coughs> to improve the employment and economic situation of the deprived groups more generally so that is quite an, an, an important an important uh, finding uh, the other important element of important finding that came out was that the international community i think francis al already mentioned it as well that the international community who could play a vital role in in shaping uh, policy in in, in post-conflict eras um, did not actually take up that role and uh, considerations of uh, horizontal inequality did not come into to standard policy making and, and uh, design of policy. Um, unsurprisingly, therefore, in more than half of the cases that we studied, we saw that uh, horizontal inequalities sh worsened in the post-conflict era, which is clearly a very, uh, a very worrying sign uh, indeed. Uh, from that, um, the main policy recommendation and the books we, we give uh, a range of other other ones, but the main one is basically that we should start taking uh, HI consideration or horizontal inequality considerations more seriously, both local governments but also the international donor community. Now, clearly there are a number of uh, of caveats when, when doing policy in in this respect. If we think about post-conflict uh, countries, they face clearly face a lot of difficult challenges. Clearly, there need to be policies towards reconstruction, towards growth, towards employment creation, towards poverty reduction. And sometimes there might be a trade-off necessary between considerations of horizontal inequalities. But in most cases, these two uh, policy, uh, policies in, in, in these different fields of, of, uh, of different sectors are very much complementary. Another complicating factor in this respect is that there is no one-size-fits-all uh, one approach. So we really need to analyze the, the local situation very carefully before designing policies. We cannot just say we need to implement it across the board in, in post-conflict uh, countries. Having said that, and, 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 taking and, and, and <coughs> despite these cautions that there are, um, doing nothing and letting horizontal inequalities escalate <coughs> or worsen is, is absolutely a, a much more dangerous policy and, and in the end uh, we will end up in a worse situation. Now let me quickly turn to the second book which is linked to the, to the first book in the sense that policies towards uh, reducing horizontal inequality is not necessarily an issue that's only affecting post-conflict countries but it is actually an issue, a policy or something, a policy concern or it should be a policy concern for countries, also peaceful multi-ethnic countries <laughs> that are facing these, uh, these inequalities. And there are a range of policies and measures available that could be used to, to improve the, the situation of the deprived situation and make a society more equal. Um, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the various <coughs> books, there are a, a range of examples are given. Um, but basically, we, we divide these broad range of policies up into three categories. We have the direct ones, where basically policy, th this approach takes the targeted group as the starting point. So we could think of ethnic quotas, for instance, as a policy that would be that would fit in the, the direct approach. The indirect approach has aims to do the same effect, tries to reduce inequalities, however, tries to do that by general policies. Uh, however, due to the fact that the deprived goods uh, benefit disproportionately from, from these general policies, it will have the same effect. And then there's the integrationist policies, which is not necessarily aimed immediately at uh, reducing inequalities, but rather at decreasing the salience of group boundaries. Now, in this book, we focus on one important uh, direct policy, affirmative action. And we looked at, at affirmative action in a comparative setting uh, in seven cases. Again, the cases are, are given. And it's quite surprising how little research, comparative research, there is done on, on comparing the, the different experiences of these uh, of countries that have implemented affirmative action policies so in this sense this book is, is really trying to address this this lacuna uh, in that sense but we recognize as well and we are very conscious of that that there are the, the, the introduction and the, the experience of these countries are very different their starting points in time are very different with India starting in late 1940s and Brazil starting in late 1990s there's also a, a very different political basis for introducing the policies and we try to take that into account and, uh, in the analysis. Uh, there's clearly not enough time to expand on that here. Now, quickly, some findings and a 
conclusion, and then I probably have to finish. Um, affirmative action in the cases that we studied appear to have a positive effect on reducing inequalities, although in most cases that didn't mean that the inequalities were actually uh, completely vanished, but they remained quite large. Um, in the cases where affirmative action policies were introduced in response to earlier violence, as for instance in Malaysia, uh, there was no a relapse into violence. Um, if we think about uh, an important critique towards affirmative action is often that it hardens the group boundaries or, 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 or makes the division, sharpens the, the division. Um, in our case, that was very difficult to assess because in the cases that we studied, the boundaries, the group boundaries were very, very, very clear once the policies were introduced. So it's very difficult for us to, to make that assessment. Another point of critique one often hears towards affirmative action is that it leads to a loss of economic efficiency, that there's a trade-off uh, with, with economic growth goals. The evidence in our case is actually points to the, to the opposite uh, scenario, that it, for instance, as Malaysia and Brazil have had tremendous economic growth records mm -hmm. at the time as that they had a, uh, an affirmative action program. So to come to a conclusion, we argue in the book that affirmative action policies can play an important role in reducing horizontal inequalities. They need to be carefully managed and there need to be a built-in exit strategy in order for them to be politically accepta uh, acceptable and ultimately uh, achieve its goal of reducing inequalities. Thank you. Thanks very much, I mean. Um